So I want to go to a familiar passage that you've know, heard about many a times, but I want to get in there about something, and that's going to be in John chapter 11. This is where Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. This is John chapter 11, verse 1. And I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Amen? All right, here we go. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent for him, saying, Lord, behold, him who, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after he said to the disciples, after this he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for days. Amen. I'm going to stop right there. Praise the name of the Lord. The thing I love about God's word is you can speak God's word and it has many applications and you can preach it so many different kind of ways depending on the situation at hand. The situation at hand today is I'm calling this message waiting on the Lord. We are waiting on the Lord. Now, personally, I don't like waiting. And most of you don't like waiting either. So you don't even need to laugh at me because you're laughing at yourself. We in this, we in this time, everybody wants something right now, right now. But I'm going to narrow the scope because sometimes you shouldn't wait. Especially when the level of urgency is at a critical stage. Um... I have a greater expectation that I place on my family and close friends when I'm in a situation of high priority. And, 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 and ex I have an expectation that when I call that you will show up quickly. Like, come on, I'm in trouble. Hurry up. Come right now. Ambulance is coming. Come right now. Hurry up. This just happened. Come right now. I'm expecting them to drop what they have and make me a priority. This is not something that you call frequently for. They will know by the emotion in my voice that this is serious. 
If they fail me, yes, there will be extreme disappointment. Because the first thing I'm going to say is, what took you so long? I told you I needed you to come right now. You let me down. You let me down. I told you I needed you. Now it's too late. Where were you? You know, but that's between us, me, family, and close friends. So I asked myself as I read this passage, but what if it's not a person I'm waiting on? What if it's God I'm waiting on? What am I to say to him? God, where are you at? Don't you see me down here? Don't you see the pain that I'm in right now? Don't you see the hurt that I'm dealing with? Don't you see the situation that's at hand? Didn't I tell you I needed you by this time? You said to call out to you and you would show up. Where are you? I called on you. And I don't see you. It doesn't even look like you're moving at all. People are mocking me like, I thought you was, you know, your God that you believe where he, he hasn't shown up. You sure that your God is real? You sure that your God does all the things that you've been talking about all the time, preaching about and quoting scriptures about and all of that? Are you sure? This is the enemy saying, where is your God? Where is he? If he was the Lord, he would have done something about it already. Is there anybody in here, and I'm going to say yes just based on the quietness right now, that's been waiting on the Lord for a long time for something, and you're a little bit salty that he hasn't shown up already. You're a little bit frustrated because he hasn't already done it, and you've been waiting for a long time. Amen. Our expectation, though, is not always in alignment with his divine purpose. So I want to kind of just share a few things for, with you today to kind of help you because, you know, your emotion is going to be your emotion. When you're waiting on something and it doesn't come up, you're going to feel whatever you feel. But if you have information, you won't make a bad decision. I have a friend that suffered a very unfortunate injury a few years ago, and it requires him to have grueling rehabilitation, and he has to depend on mobility devices now. Um, when it happened, it was suddenly, and there was nothing that could have shown up in any health screening that explains the phenomenon. It came out of nowhere. Nothing could have prevented it. Doctors said nothing could have prevented it because we couldn't see it. We don't even know how it happened. The previous day was a good day. That previous day before this happened to him, it was a great day. He was going, he's a Christian. He was doing things in his strength. He was in the center of where he thought God wanted him to do. He was doing great things. He was inspirational. People were touched by what he was doing, shaking his hand, glad of his presence, everything. He's a good man, good father, good, good husband, does great things for the community, everything good, 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 good. But the next day was the day of trouble. And all of a sudden, his world was rocked. Some people would say, well, why did this happen to him? People that go through trouble say, why does this happen to me? One of these days, I'll do a message on bad things, good people. Because you live in this life and everybody has to deal with suffering. Everybody deals with trials and tribulations, and not everything has a cause and effect like you think it does. 
Sometimes you did not do anything wrong. But it happened to you, and it happened to me. Does God know about it? Yes, he knows about it. Did God send it? No, not necessarily. Is he going to remove it immediately? Not necessarily. Then I don't understand. Good, then we are all together. Because there are things about God that you cannot understand. Why me? Why not you? Good th bad things happen to good people all over the world. I live in a good place, in a good country. I have a good family, everything is well. But my brethren abroad are constantly under attack. My brethren abroad are being martyred for their faith all the time. They are homeless. They are destitute. They are going through trouble all the time. They go through hardship all the time. They say, why me? God said, I'm using you. Where is God <clears throat> when you need him most? The temptation is for you to be offended and to let the enemy draw you away in that offense. The temptation is to put an ultimatum on God. God, if you don't do this, then I'm walking away. God said, okay. You'll be back. Because let me tell you something, and I, you know, and I really do have, you know, if I say anything, I don't want anybody to feel offended like I don't feel what you're going through. But let me tell you, you're not going to make God do something that he doesn't want to do. There's nothing you could do to make God do something that he is not intended to do. But the temptation is to make a bad, rushed decision. The temptation is to do something different outside of the Lord. I am telling you, I am imploring you to not do that. Before we go through the scripture a little bit, I want to first tell you that I empathize with whatever it is that you are going through. Because I'm going to say a few things and some might be a little tough to swallow. But I'm going to tell you something, I'm going to show you something in this passage that you may have missed just by me reading it. I'm human like you and I never know I could wake up tomorrow and life could be different. So I say this very humbly, because I never, you don't know the future. Things happen to you, things happen to your family, and pain is pain. Let's go through this scripture for a little bit. It says in the verse one, Lazarus of Bethany. This is the only place in the Bible, by the way, that we talked about Lazarus, his sisters. Mary and Martha said, Lord, the one you love is sick. They are leaning on the power of that relationship. Remember I said, if, I, if it's close family, close friends, I expect you to show up quickly. They are like, Lord, you love him. We family, Lord, like we got good connection. You love him. They sent message. Go and tell Jesus to hurry it up. He got the message. Mary and Martha know Jesus got the message. And he was only a day's journey away. And not only that, but we're talking about Jesus, the Son of Man. He walks on water. Jesus, he controls the winds and the waves. Jesus, he opens the eyes of the blind. Jesus, he, he can heal leprosy. Jesus, he can do anything. He can get here. As a matter of fact, we talk in Jesus, he don't even have to come here. He could just say the word. He could just speak the word and Lazarus would recover. The sisters, 
you know, we have the benefit of reading the Bible and having the providential view. We can know the beginning from the end, but if you didn't have this view and you were there and you're Mary and you're Martha, you are extremely agitated. Like, are you serious? We told you he's sick and he's about to die. We know you got the message, Lord. We know that you can prevent him from dying. And where are you? You didn't even move. You didn't even come this way. Aren't we, uh, uh, maybe I got this wrong. Maybe you don't love me. Maybe I should reevaluate our relationship. Because you love Lazarus, right? You love me and Martha, right? We served you. Remember, remember Martha and me, we were serving you, and I asked you, could you make Martha like, like come back here in the kitchen with me? He says, no, like we have a relationship. Maybe we, our relationship is not the way. Maybe you don't love me. But what does the scripture says? Jesus loved them. Do you see this? God loves us, but we get in situations that we feel like maybe God does not love us. Maybe he does not favor us. He healed so-and-so. He healed this one and that one. But why me? Why am I still in the condition that I'm in? Why does he delay with me? I pray to him. I read the scripture. I give tithes and offerings. I, I bowed. I prayed for other people. I do all kinds of things. And he healed somebody who ain't even half serving them. Come on now. Come on. Come on now. I know, I know y'all feel what I'm saying. I mean, he set that one person free. Like, come on, God. There's people better than him. So we start to get angry. But what we don't know is that God has a plan. When we're angry, what we don't know is that God has a plan. He's working a plan. It says in verse 5, now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister, but when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days. I'm like, God, you ain't even going to come to the funeral, goodness. You're going to straight up, not only are you not going to show up, you're not even going to come to the funeral and give last respects. The funeral over, Jesus. We buried him, Jesus. I got people looking out for you, and they're like, you still in the same town. Like, now I'm starting to feel offended. Like, not only do I think you don't love me, but I think, like, did I do something wrong to you? Like, what is going on here? We're waiting on you. He doesn't, maybe he doesn't love me. Maybe I did something to him. But look what the Bible says. He said, this, this is not unto death. He said, this ain't unto death. I'm going to wait. He's going he to be all right. But Mary and Martha didn't hear that. Do y'all understand what I'm saying here? Come on, let me know if you're alive. Say amen. All right. Lazarus, the one is dead. Y'all don't be dead. Listen. You don't know what God is doing, but God knows what he's doing. From God's perspective, Lazarus was sent for a specific purpose. And he was about to now use him for that purpose. From your perspective, you say, 
God, you could prevent this. God says, no, I don't want to prevent it. I want to use it. Amen. I don't want to prevent it. I want to use it. Amen. So when he gets there, it's been four days. My gosh, my gosh. You know, I prayed this morning. I said, Lord, I got so much content. I don't know what I want to talk about. <laughs> I said, help me to just like get away what I don't want to talk about or talk about it another time. I'll, I'll say some things a little later. But you know what? It's been four days. And he know what he said to the disciples. He says, you know, I'm glad I wasn't there. He's not saying I'm, I'm glad about situation because he's touched by the feeling of our infirmity. So he's like, I feel their pain. I understand their pain. But for what I know is about to happen, I'm glad I'm not there because I need to make sure Lazarus is good and dead. I need to make sure the situation in your life is good and dead. I need to make sure that what you think is already too late. I want to make sure that when I set you free, when I change the situation, that everybody says, oh my God, that was a miracle. There is nothing, nothing that anybody can say. Oh, that was because Lazarus wasn't all the way dead. Oh, that was because maybe they didn't know he was still breathing. Oh, oh no, 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 no. I'm going to wait two more days till that man is decaying until it's stinking so bad that nobody can even say that he ain't dead. So he said, I'll wait. It's just like waking him up. See, God's perspective and your perspective is wrong. For us, when something is dead, we say it's final. If God said, nope, it's just sleeping, it's just on ice, it's temporary. Amen. What you think is final, God says is temporary. But sometimes God wants you to think it's final so he can prove to you that God who takes things that are dead and brings them back to life. He wants you to know that he has the ability to bring it back to life. He can take those dead bones and make them speak again. He can take your situation that you went through and you said, oh my gosh, my life is over. And God says, oh no, I'm going to make that test a testimony and everybody going to see that I'm the God who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Amen. God said, no, I put Lazarus here on purpose. I didn't make Lazarus sick, but I knew he was going to be sick. I knew it was going to result in death, and I feel your pain, Mary. I feel your pain, Martha. I feel your pain, all of Bethany. I feel your pain, everybody. But let me tell you something. You don't know what I know. You don't know what I know. That all I'm going to do is just do what we purpose this man to do. I sent him so that he would die, so that I could raise him up, so that you will see that I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. Amen. I wanted that man to be a walking poster board for me. I wanted that man to be the one that I would say, he's the one that proves that he is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the life giver, that he is the resurrection and the life. So now every time you see Lazarus walk around, you be like, look at God, look at God, look at God, look at God. I thought my brother was dead. I thought Jesus didn't love me. I thought he didn't care about me. I thought he waited too long because he just, I did something wrong. But I didn't know that God planned before the foundation of the world to send Lazarus into the world and that it would result into his death so that I could raise him up so that everybody would know that God is able to do the impossible. Amen. I said, amen. amen. 
because he is the sovereign God. God does whatever he pleases. You say, God, but why me? God said, who are you to reply against me? Why have you made you this way? I made you this way because I am going to use you. You don't know what God is doing. I said earlier that it's not all about you. Sometimes the things that's happening to you, it's not all about you, although it includes you. Sometimes the thing that's happening to you is so that God could reach me. Sometimes the things that you are enduring is so that God can reach your family, your community. Amen. When you write that book about how you thought your life was over and how God rescued you, God said, see, look, I deliver. See, look. When you talk about how terrible your childhood was and all the pain that you endured and how you made it over and God said, see, I carried you on eagle's wings. I was with you. I was with you. And then God uses you to be able to tell other people how to come out. Amen. You go, God, I don't want to go through that. I don't like this pain. I don't want to go through God says, I know, I know, but I got a whole community that's riding on you. I got a whole community that's riding on you. If you make it through, I'm going to bring them through through your testimony. You affect other people's lives. I read this book. Uh, actually, I listened to it. I, like, I, during the pandemic, I was doing a whole lot of listening to uh, Audible. And it was this lady um, had a book. Um, her name was Sint Marshall. She's the first black female CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. She wrote this book, and it was called You Have Been Chosen. It covers her personal and professional life, but it also chronicles a painful journey that she had. She was not able to have children. She had four miscarriages. And then at age 49, because she had friends that kept saying, you need to go get screenings, she said she promised to get it right before her 50th birthday. And so she went to get a health screening, and she had stage 3 colon cancer. And she thought, oh, my gosh, my life is over. All these great things I've done, and... And it makes you question who you are as a person. And she was, a, she's a Christian, but she admitted in her book that she wasn't necessarily as faithful as she was. And so, but she knew her mom was. So she called her mom and said, mom, you know, pray for me. I don't, I don't know why this has happened to me. I got, I found out I got stage three cancer. And her mom was a really big intercessory prayer. She prayed and talked to God about it and she said, she called her back and she said, you know, God spoke to me about your situation and the reason why you're, you asked why did this happen to you, God said, you have been chosen. She said, what does that mean? You have been chosen. God is going to use you. Thinking about, I thought, I, when I heard that, I, I, I stopped what I was listening to. And I thought, this is an interesting way of thinking. I never, this kind of interrupts my theology. I don't understand this. So God, you're not going to heal her immediately of this cancer? No. Did she have to get chemo? Yes. Did she go through pain? Yes. But she was healed of stage three cancer. She lived to tell about it. She wrote a book about it. And immediately after she got healed of that, because she I forget where she worked prior, that's when the owner of the Dallas Mavericks called her up and said, I need you to be over my diversity inclusion 
and over and be and then and, and being over the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks, the only first black woman to be so. She wrote the book. I read the book. I was inspired. My friend I told you about, I gave him the book. I said, read this book. It ain't going to solve it, but it'll let you know that God will take you through your situation and he can get you to the end. It could be that God is aligning things in accordance with his divine calendar. Whatever you're going through, God could be moving things and shifting things. Because remember, I said that God got his, his hands on the portals of history, on everything. So it's your life, how it intersects with my life, to someone else's life, to someone else's life. And God is shifting things. God is moving things. And everything has purpose. Even the pain that you're in. A big thing that I pulled from this passage your life and whatever you go through, it's all for the glory of God. It's for his glory. God, if I must endure pain and hardship so that you can amplify yourself, so that people would be drawn to you, as much as I don't like it, I say go for it, God. Go for it. If it brings you glory so that people would be drawn to you, so that my family members would come to you, so that my friends would come to you, so that my associates would come to you, so that my neighbors would come to you, God, you can use me. I'll endure it. I'll deal with it. I'll hate it every step of the way, but I'll do it if that's what you want me to do, if you need me to endure it. But I'm going to tell you that you must continue to bleed to the end because you may not have to endure it as long as you think you have to endure it. But believe always every day that today could be the day. The day could be the day. Amen. So much more I could talk to you here. You know, um, another time we'll talk about it, but I want you to understand that there is a spirit realm. And sometimes there are things you cannot see that is happening. I'll just throw this out quickly because my time is spent. And that is, I know there was a place in Daniel, I believe chapter 10, that he prayed for three weeks. Three weeks praying and fasting and calling out to God. And, and eventually... God, the answer came to him, an angel said to him, said, you know, from the moment you prayed, God heard you. He said, but we was fighting this principality and these demons and things trying to prevent you from getting the answer. Good thing, Daniel, you kept praying all the way to the end. Good thing you kept praying to the end because your answer may not have reached you. The angel said, I need to get help. I need to get Michael, I need to get, I need to get help to fight the principalities to stop you from getting this very important message that the ages of the church would need to know about. So good thing, Daniel, you kept praying. So I'm saying to you, whatever your situation is, keep praying, keep believing, keep trusting, keep fighting, keep laboring. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give in. Don't ever feel sorry. Don't let the devil make you feel like you're not a person. Don't let the devil make you feel like you're not worth something. Don't let the devil feel like you're never going to be what God's called you to be. Trust in the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Amen. Come on, everybody in the house, praise the Lord. Come on and praise the Lord. Come on and praise the Lord. Strengthen yourselves in God. Wait on the Lord no matter how long he takes. The whole chapter of Hebrews 11 of the household of faith, those folks believed God until the end, and it says they did not even receive it when they died because God left it for us. Believe it all the way to die. If I believe God and I die, 
then I'm just going to be like Lazarus because I'm going to wake up on the other side. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to fight until the end. You fight until the end. You don't give up on your family members, your friends, yourself, anybody. Don't give up. Don't give up. I'm telling you now, by the Spirit of a living God, don't give up. Let God do his work. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to stop right there. We're going to go to altar call. I'm going to stop right there. That, that, thank you, Lord. Work with that. God is doing his work. God is working his work. Wait on God. Don't give up. Don't give in. You might be frustrated right now. You might be troubled right now. You might be really angry about a situation, a problem, a problem at work, a problem with ministry, a problem with sickness, a problem with whatever. Whatever it is, just don't ever feel angry. Listen, God can handle, handle your temporary frustration with him. Trust me, he, you, you got nothing on Job, okay? You got nothing on Job. Nothing on Job. Job had no idea that a deal was being made. But God took Job through so that we can see that even when the devil takes us to our limit, we still won't curse God. Still won't curse God. If Job can do it, you can do it because you have the Spirit of God on the inside of you, and greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Okay, Lord, I'm going to stop right there. Come on, let's prepare for the altar call. You know, I said that God prepared before the foundation of the world. Every person has a purpose and God wants everyone to realize that purpose but the enemy he, he's throwing people off purpose all the time when I gave my life to Christ God helped me to rediscover my purpose The one thing that I am here to tell you today, I'm going to use this passage to do so, is that we have to take action if we want things to be right. Amen. He said, move that stone. He said, no, he stinks right now. We can't move the stone. He said, didn't I say? that I'm the resurrection and the life. If you, if you want this man raised up, you got to make a step and you got to move that stone. If you want to see the dead to come back to life, you need to take the step and move the obstacle that keeps the death, the dead from crossing over into life. Thank you, Jesus. I know where you're going, God, now. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, prior to coming into Christ, you are spiritually dead from God's perspective. If you want to cross over into the newness of life, you have to step up and say, I would like to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. You have to make the step. You have to say, I receive him into my life. I want him and I receive him into my life. So all I'm simply going to do today is ask if you want to make that step. So everyone else, all eyes, eyes can be closed for the moment. Let's give them a moment to think this over. If you're here in the building, and you want to make Jesus Christ 
your Lord and Savior, I want to see you just raise your hand where you are and say, I would like to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. I'll give you a few moments. I see a real little hand back there. I see two little hands back there. I see three little hands back there. Hold on, let me just, let me verify these hands. Are these, are these hands of I want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior? If we do, wave them like that. Oh, I see it, I see it, I see it. Um, is that mama next to them? Grandma, did they, are, are you okay with them coming and receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior? All right, send them on down. Send them on down. Come on, rejoice as they come. If there's anyone else that want to receive Jesus as a Lord and Savior, come on now. Come on now. Come on, praise the Lord. Oh, you come all the way up here. Come on. Come on. Amen. Praise the Lord. You're the mom? All three of these here? Praise the Lord. Oh, five. Come on, y'all. Praise the Lord. This is real. This is real. You all want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Okay. Well, it's going to happen. So, can you all like raise your hands like this? You can raise them together if you want. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive you. I make you the Lord and Savior of my life. I come out of the world and I come into Christ. You, I belong to you and you belong to me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. I love you. I'll always be with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. Come on. Give me hugs. Give me hugs. Praise God. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to walk, go with mom, and, and, and a minister or someone's going to go with all of you, get names, and take you next steps. Amen. Come on. Can we rejoice for the children of the kingdom of God? Praise the Lord. Oh, how I wish I had received Christ when I was that young. And they meant it. I want you to know they meant it. I looked in their eyes. They meant it. Amen. Hallelujah. If you're here and you said, you know, I've experienced enough, I've seen enough, I want to join Abundant Life Fellowship Church I think what we'll do is have them meet in the room. In the room to the left. Go ahead. You, you're going to say it, Ann? What do you want to say? Okay, okay. Ann said. Okay. When you leave out of this room, go out, make a quick left, and they will tell you next steps so that you can become a member of Abundant Life Fellowship Church. And we will be so glad and honored to have you. Amen. All right, continue to wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart.